get your Bibles and open to Psalm 5. Psalm 5. We find ourselves this morning in uh, book one of the Psalms, and this morning again going to hear, read the word of uh, one of the Psalms that is a Psalm of Lament, one of the genres of the Psalms we've referred to before. And uh, thank you, Dennis, for that uh, song. That was the perfect, the perfect song this morning for this song. This is the word of God. It's true, it's holy, it's right, it's righteous. Lend your ears this morning to the true word of God. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies, the Lord of whores, the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth, their inmost self is destruction, their throat is an open grave, they flatter with their tongue, make them bear their guilt, O God, let them fall by their own counsels, because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice, let them ever sing for joy, and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you, for you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Again, we thank you for this day that you've set set aside that we know as the Lord's day to, to come and to worship your holy son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to be enthralled with you, O God to stand in wonder of your might and your power and your beauty. Lord, help us this morning. Help us to hear you. Help us to believe you, to trust you, and to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Besides C.S. Lewis, probably my other favorite author, besides maybe the Apostle Paul, is J.R.R. Tolkien. I love J.R.R. Tolkien. Thank you, Daryl. And uh, I love the book, The Lord of the Rings. If you haven't read The Lord of the Rings, well, there'll be time for you to repent later. (laughs) It's a great book. It's a classic book. And it'll be read for years and years to come. If you haven't seen the book, then you can see the movie. But you know, the book is always better, right? It's a classic tale of good versus evil of light versus darkness, of tyranny versus freedom. And there's a scene in The Lord of the Rings where they come to this massive battle. And the armies of darkness are are arrayed against the good people of Middle-earth. And there's orcs and goblins and monsters and all sorts of, of wickedness arrayed against them. And on this field of Pelennor, there is a young woman named Elwyn who finds herself in the midst of this battle. She snuck onto the battlefield, basically, got herself there, and she's arrayed in her armor, and she's there to fight, and she finds herself in the battle with the witch king of Angmar. 
If you don't know anything about the book, then you'll just know he's one bad dude. He's a sorcerer. He's with his armor. He's got all this stuff that he can bring to the battle. He's the lord of the Nazgul, another evil band of witches. And there he comes with this massive weapon to do battle with this young maiden of Rohan. He has a huge flail, a stick with a chain and a giant spiked ball on it. In the movie, it looks like something you couldn't even lift humanly possible. But he stands there with his evil helmet and, and out comes this giant mace. And Elwyn brings out her little sword and a shield. And as he flails this giant mace around his head, he, she, she, she ducks it a few times but finally she tries to block and he hits that shield and her shield shatters along with her arm. Elwyn has a problem. What's her problem in that scene, in that situation? Elwyn needs a better shield. One that is strong. One that is impervious to the attacks of her enemy. A shield throughout the Bible is metaphorically usually spoken of as, as that which is symbolic of protection, of security, of hope. A shield is something that can go with you wherever you go. In medieval times, a shield was a personal uh, piece of armor held in the hand. It could be strapped to the wrist or the forearm. Shields are used to intercept specific attacks. They could be uh, used for close-range weaponry like swords or axes or mace. Or they could also uh, protect you from long-range attacks like arrows. Shields uh, varied in greatly in, in size and shape. But the bottom line was a shield was for your protection. The question for us today is simply this. When the enemy attacks, will your shield fail? Another question is simply this. Do you have a shield? For others, in the sound of my voice, the question is this. Do you realize you're on the battlefield? Do you even know there's a war going on? There are five elements here in this psalm that are going to help us today as we consider the shield of the righteous. Number one, God hears his people. Number two, God hates evildoers. Number three, God has made a way for his people. Number four, God will cast out all rebels. And finally, God is the shield of his people. So let's get started. Number one, God hears his people. Look at the first verse of our psalm. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Charles Spurgeon said this regarding this section. He says there are two sorts of prayers, those expressed in words and the unuttered longings which abide as silent meditations or groanings. Words are not the essence of prayer, but the garments of prayer. Spurgeon goes on to say, Moses at the Red Sea cried to God, though he said nothing. Yet the use of language may prevent distraction of mind, may assist the powers of the soul, may excite devotion. David comes here and he asks for God in his lament to give attention, to hear his groanings he hears my groanings he hears my cry he hears my prayer he hears my voice who hears who hears David says my king and my God friend in your times of lament, in your times of trial, in your times of battle, on the field of battle, where do you take those cries, those groanings, those prayers? You take your groanings, you take your cries, 
You take your prayers, you take your voice to the one who can really do something about it. I was sitting in my office a few weeks ago, working on a sermon, maybe writing in my journal. My office is Panera. (laughs) I have a booth with a brass plaque on it there, Pastor Brian. That's where I meet many of you in the morning or do some sermon preparation or other journal writing or thinking. And I couldn't help but hear people in the next table over. Some work group, a couple of people, and they're just talking, gossip, office gossip, complaining. And it's one of those where you kind of like, you're, you're almost embarrassed to get, I don't want to get up and leave because they're going to see me get up and leave, and they're going to think that's the reason I got up and left. So I just sit there, and I'm trying not to listen, and, and they're just going on and on and on and on, talking and complaining about these people at work, and the boss, and this, and that, and this, and that. All they're doing is just what we call venting, Right? They don't expect real change. They're not talking to someone who can make real change. They're just venting. Does David just vent? My life sucks. My life is hard. These things are bad. No, David takes his concerns somewhere. He takes them to the king of the universe. I was at that same Panera later, and I went to the restroom, and The restroom was in really bad disarray. Things had fallen off and broken. And and so I went to a little girl who worked there and said, excuse me, but in the men's bathroom, this thing is broken and it's not working. And and she's like, (laughs) right? Like, oh, this is, I'm not talking to the right person, right? I vented to my buddy, Dwayne, who's there at Panera all the time. And and, uh, and so, and I thought, no, I need, to, I need to talk to, and so I went and said, can I speak to the manager? The manager came out and she was kind of like, do the same thing, like, oh, really? You know, and I think, can I, can I, can you give me the number of like your boss? <laughs> who's the, and so she did. She gave me the num- name of this guy who's over five Paneras. And I called him and I talked to him and I said, this is my Panera. Okay, this is my office. <laughs> can you please? Fi-? And he was gracious and kind. And the next day this thing was fixed. Because I went to the person who had the authority, who had the power and the ability to get something done. Brothers and sisters, we have a God. We have a king who is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is the one who we take our concerns to in our times of distress. Bruce Waltke said this, about this section. He says, by turning to God in distress and addressing Him, the petitioner shows his complete dependence on God. To look elsewhere for deliverance would be tantamount to idolatry. When we are in trouble, when we are in despair, when we are in distress, we go to the one who was our King and our God. To go anywhere else is idolatry. Notice when the psalmist lays out his prayers in the morning. In the morning. John Piper said this about this section. He says, very few of us wake up strengthened to do all of those glorious works that we get to join Jesus in doing. So the new course for the morning is laid out in the Psalms. And here's the key. O Lord, in the morning... You hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Some translators translate this section, uh, make my prayers or lay out my prayers for you. I prepare my sacrifice. I lay out my prayers. Let the first thing out of my mouth in the morning be, I love you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Help me, Lord. When the alarm goes off or when your eyes open, and your head is still on that pillow, let the first utterance from your mouth be, help me, God. Help me, God. Help me to do your will. Help me to love you as I ought. Be with me today. Then prepare a sacrifice. John Piper, he believes that the sacrifice is my body. It's a living sacrifice. I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to ask God to help me. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch 
I'm going to wait and watch for the Lord to show up and do what? I'm watching for these things. Psalm 143, 8 says this, Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. So we're looking as we prepare ourselves in the morning for the steadfast love of God, and we're, and we're watching to see where he's working in the lives of our brothers and sisters, where he's preparing me for a trial or, a, or an obstacle or, a, or, or an opportunity that day. Let the first words of my mouth, while I'm still on my pillow, be, I need you again today. Psalm 90, 14 says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Oh, satisfy me with the steadfast love that I may rejoice and be glad in all of my days. We watch for God's word and we look into his word. After we wake up, we then open our word and we, and we get into it and we look for his steadfastness throughout the scriptures. And we're encouraged to see it. I don't know where you and your scripture reading are right now, but I'm in Job. And so, and so daily I'm, I'm encouraged as I hear from Job and, and see the obstacles he's facing and the trials that he's going through and that God himself is directing his path. I'm waiting and I'm watching and I'm looking, prepared. In the morning, Spurgeon says, in the morning, this is the fittest time for communication with God. An hour in the morning is worth two in the evening. An hour in the morning is worth two in the evening. We're ready. We're prayed up when the boss arrives. We're ready. We're prayed up when that challenge comes. We're ready. When we're prayed up when the, when the children come out with sleepy eyes and, and saying, Mom, what's for breakfast? We're ready. Spurgeon says, while the dew is on the grass, let grace drop upon the soul. Let us give to God the mornings of our days and the morning of our lives. Prayer should be the key of the day and the lock of the night. Devotion should be both the morning star and the evening star. So God hears. God hears his beloved. He hears his people. Number two, God hates evildoers. Back in the psalm, he says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. Our first point was that God hears the prayers of his people. He does hear them. But then this next section goes into the four. For you are because you hear the prayers of your people, but also, look, with these people, because you're not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you, be with you, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. What is an evildoer? It's a trick question. What's an evildoer? Someone who does evil. Okay? Simply that. Someone who does evil. What is evil? Anything that is against God's holiness and perfection. Evil anything that is against God's holiness and perfection. The Apostle Paul helps us with this in Galatians 5 as he challenges the Galatians to not fall away from grace and back into works. And here he encourages them about their walking according to the Spirit or according to the flesh. And he says this in Galatians 5, 17, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Well, what are those works of the Spirit, the Galatians ask? And Paul answers. Now the works of the flesh, did I say Spirit? I meant flesh. The works of the flesh are evident. What's evil? What's works of the flesh? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
What does it simply mean? It's the same thing that, that, that the psalmist is saying here, that David is saying. Those who do these things, those who dwell in these kinds of things, that's the pattern of their life, they may not dwell with God. They may not live with God. They not, may not come into his house because these things are against the Lord. Think about these things. Parents, one that stands out is fits of anger. I know an unbelieving couple who has a child who throws fits of anger. And I can hear from my own house these fits of anger. And it's tolerated. We as parents, Christian parents, we train our children. We train our children in godliness and righteousness. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He's, it's, it's like he's saying, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's more of these things. We, anything that goes against God is, is evil, and we ought not to act that way. And those who make it the pattern of their lives will not be able to dwell with God. Spurgeon says this, as Kenny spent a lot of time with Augustine a few weeks ago, uh, I spent my time with Spurgeon this week. Uh, no better study buddy uh, than Charles Spurgeon, if you're going to be in the Word. He says this, Let us learn here the solemn truth of the hatred which a righteous God must bear towards sin. He has no pleasure in wickedness, however wittily, grandly, and proudly it may array, it, it may array us itself. Its glitter has no charm for him. That's a, that's a powerful thing to think about. Wickedness has no charm. Evil has no charm for him. No matter how cool it is, no matter how slick it is, no matter how the turn of the phrase in the sitcom we're watching, that we chuckle at. That's wicked, but it's kind of funny, isn't it? Jesus is not chuckling along with you, right? No. He says, men may bow before successful villainy. Well, he must be doing something, right? Look how wealthy he is. And forget the wickedness of the battle in the gaudiness of the triumph. But the Lord of holiness is not such a one as we are. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. He will not afford it the meanest shelter. God will not allow any little shack of wickedness to dwell within his presence. Neither on earth nor in heaven shall evil share the mansion of God. Oh, how foolish are we if we attempt to entertain two guests so hostile to one another as Christ Jesus and the devil. Rest assured, Christ will not live in the parlor of our hearts if we entertain the devil in the cellar of our thoughts. That's convicting. That's, if that's not convicting to you, then you got a problem. And the gospel is what's here to help you with that problem today. We can't entertain Jesus and the devil at the same time. We can't entertain, bring Jesus and ask him to come into our living room and, and entertain him there when in the cellar of our thoughts the devil is existing. No, God hates evil doers. Sam Storm says this, David prays for justice. Many would prefer to ignore the words, you hate, you, God, hate all evildoers, as well as David's plea for God to make them bear their guilt and that God will fall by their own, that, that God would let them fall by their own counsels, that they be cast out because of the abundance of their transgressions. For us, Storm says, hate is an evil desire for personal revenge that is the fruit of malice, vindictiveness, spite, bitterness, resentment, jealousy, or self-centeredness. For God, hate is a righteous opposition to anything that is an affront to holiness. It is God's holy displeasure for sins committed and a holy determination to punish. God hates the evildoer, and he will not dwell with them. That brings us to point number three. But God has made a way for his people. Look at verses seven and eight. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your 
way straight before me. How can David dwell with the Lord? How can we, because as we've already went through these passages and as even in, in our instruction for communion, we've realized that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all of us know that there's evil within us. So then how can David dwell with the Lord? How can we dwell with the Lord? Can I come to God's house and somehow force my way in? Can I kick down the door and say, I'm coming in by my own good works, by my own righteousness? Jesus speaks of, of this, of, of, him, of himself, when he talks about these very ideas, John 10, 1 through 10. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but clum- climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. How can David go into the temple of the Lord? How can David enter into the presence of God? Because of God's steadfast love. And we spell steadfast love, J-E-S-U-S. Jesus is the profound and ultimate reality of God's steadfast love to you, brothers and sisters. How may we enter into the presence of a holy God when we are evildoers, when we do evil? Because of Jesus Christ. Because He's the entrance into God's presence. He is the door, and He calls us by name. He knows us, he hears us, and we follow him. If you hear his voice, you are his sheep. If while I'm preaching this gospel and doing the best I can with prayer and petition to have you come to the Lord, if you just say, huh, you don't belong to God. Do you hear his voice? Do you hear him calling you? Do you see what he has done for you? He has borne your sins upon himself in the tree, on the tree. He has died for you every single sin that you have sinned and will sin. He paid the price for at the cross. Oh, friend, come to Christ today. Come to Christ today. He himself has said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. He, because of his steadfast love, has made a way for David. He's made a way for us to come into the presence of a holy God. Spurgeon again says this, The psalmist has bent his knee in prayer. He has described before God as an argument for his deliverance the character and the fate of the wicked. And now he contrasts this with the condition of the righteous. But as for me, I will come into thy house. I will not stand at a distance. I will come into thy sanctuary just as a child comes into his father's house. But I will not come there by my own merits. No, I have a multitude of sins. And therefore, I will come in the multitude of thy mercy. I will approach thee with confidence because of thy immeasurable grace. Brothers and sisters, what a beauty. What an amazing thing. That yes, as any kind father beckons his child into the house, into his presence, we don't enter because of our greatness, because of our goodness, because of our own righteousness, but we come begging the mercy of our heavenly father. How can we who are evildoers, dwell with our king. 
because of his steadfast love. Colossians 1, 15, 22 says this. He, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, Paul says, and you who were once alienated, and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Why? In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Praise God. Huh? Praise God. Number four, God will cast out all rebels. Our psalm again, verse 9, for there is no truth back, uh, as we see David swings back and forth between the righteous and the unrighteous. For, because there is no truth, they can't dwell with God. Why? There is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. This part of the Psalms might sound familiar to you because Paul repeats this scripture in Romans 3, 9 through 18. Listen, when, when the Jews, he's talking to the Jews and Gentiles both saying, look, does, does anyone, is anyone able to enter into God's presence? Uh, can, can, can Gentiles know they're sinners? How about, how about Jews? Are they better off than Gentiles because of their ethnicity or something? He says, no, no. What then? Are Jews better off? This is Romans 3, 9 through 18. Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And here's the psalm. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of, of, of asps, of, of poisonous snakes, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. They're swift to shed blood, and their path are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This description of depraved man has been copied by the Apostle Paul here. Spurgeon also says here that, that together with their other quotations, he's placed it in the second chapter of Romans as being an accurate description of the whole human race. Not of David's enemies only, but of all men by nature. Note that he says their throat is an open sepulcher, an open grave. It's full of loathsomeness. <laughs> I can't even say it. Spurgeon. Loathsomeness of miasma, of pestilence, of death. But worse than that, it's an open sepulcher with all its evil gases issuing forth to spread death and destruction all around. So with the throat of the wicked, it would be a great mercy if it could be closed, if it could be sealed, if it could, if it could be silenced. And this is what David prays and asks God to do, to shut the mouth of the evildoer, to close up their mouth that spews out hideous gases and stenches. Here David prays boldly against the enemies of God to be destroyed. One of the commentators talked about this because we're told to, to pray for our enemies and bless those who curse us. And that's true. Those who have sinned against me, I should be praying for their salvation and praying for their strength. And I continue to pray for those who are enemies of God. But here David sees those who are enemies of God himself and he asks for justice to be done. And I believe it is appropriate and right and, and what is called for at this very time in our culture as well. That we, we, we may pray with boldness 
against those who call good evil and evil good, who are turning our world into an upside-down world, who encourage us to do horrible things like kill our own babies. We should pray against these people. We should pray against those who hate God because they hate what God has made. Those things that are made in the image of God, children and babies, we must pray against their destruction. We must pray also for their salvation because one way an enemy can be destroyed is to be turned into a friend. And so that's why we pray here for our president, who is not a believer, who hates God, for our governor who hates God, who despises God. He must be stopped. And one way that he can be stopped is for him to realize the depth of his sin that he's going to spend all eternity in hell. In our public schools where I teach, trying to take more children with them, by ta- trying to tell them to, to reject the very thing that God has made them, to slander God's good work. Brothers and sisters, we must, like David, hate what God hates and love what God loves. We can't just cluck our tongues and roll our eyes. David prays boldly for the enemies of God to be destroyed. We know that ultimately, finally, all justice will be done. If not in this life, but in the one to come. No one's going to get off. No one's going to get away. All justice will be done. But we pray while there's still time for those who hate God now to have their eyes opened to the truth of their gospel. If God can turn a Saul into a Paul, he can turn our president, he can turn our governor, he can turn your next door neighbor. It was no harder for God to turn your heart to himself than it would be to turn anyone else's. Number five, God is the shield of his people. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. So he turns from the evildoers, those who are rebellious, who have rebelled in their hearts against God. He turns and he says, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. And spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Listen to what Peter says regarding this. He says to us, those who have taken refuge in God, those who have chosen Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We chose him, why? Because we are a chosen people. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen now. Peter says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Because of Christ. Because of Christ. Because of God's steadfast love, we are no longer rebels. And the psalmist says, 
let those who are true subjects of the king, let those who are true subjects of the king rejoice, sing, exult. Why? Because God's, God has spread his protection over them. He has blessed the righteous. He covers them with favor as a shield. God is the shield of the righteous. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, most of you know that passage. Let me read it to you and we'll focus on one section. As the Apostle Paul encourages the Ephesians, he says, Finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Paul knows that they're in a battle. Be prepared, be ready, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the, the breastplate of righteous, righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish, extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Right in the middle of that passage, he speaks of this great shield. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. What is the shield of faith? Is it just wishful thinking? Is it just, I'm hoping good things, I'm thinking good things? No. I want to say to you today that the shield of faith is a person. Primarily, we are guarded first by who our enemy used to be. We all were enemies of God. And so as we put our hope and trust in Jesus Christ, he himself is our shield primarily against God, whose wrath is poured out upon that shield, Jesus Christ, and protects us from the wrath of God. And so first of all, you've got to say, man, do I have a shield? When the wrath of God comes against you, do you have any protection? Or are you just planning on taking it all on your own? faith, trust, hope. You pick up the shield. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and he will protect you. And then as we continue on in our faith, that same shield protects us from the evil one who comes to say, you're not really one of his. He's an accuser. He's a murderer. He's a liar. And so as he attacks us in his wicked schemes... Jesus continues to protect us as we hold our shield of faith, Jesus Christ. The evidence of God's steadfast love. Friend, if you stumbled in here today, if you came in here today, invited by a friend, found us online, whatever reason, if you have yet to put your hope and trust in Jesus Christ, you are shieldless. You have no protection against the wrath of God or the schemes of the evil one. I have done my part. As the pastors of this church, we have a, a role. We have a ministry. And that is to be watchmen on the wall to warn you of the impending doom that is to come. With God's help and through the power of the Holy Spirit, my prayers and beseeching Him, I believe I have fulfilled my role to you today. 
Not one of you should be able to leave here not understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've heard it five, six, seven times throughout the entire service. And so now it's up to you to put your faith in Christ. Put your faith in Christ. Pick up your shield and walk. Rejoice. Enjoy singing, exulting in God as your heavenly Father. I entrust you into his care even now. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that your words that have been uttered from this pulpit and my words have been right and righteous. I pray that those who have heard, who are yet to put their hope and trust in you, would do so today. Move in power upon their heart and turn their hearts toward you, that they may believe and trust in you and have salvation. For those of us who have put our trust in you, Lord, help this to be a reminder that we need to continue walking with you. Remind us, Lord, that we, we're still on the battlefield. There are many prayers to be offered many children to be raised, many churches to be planted, many souls to be saved. There's work to be done. Lord, let us not, God, let us not be found AWOL. Let us not be at R&R. &R. There's plenty of time for that after we die. Help us to be on the field, put our hand to the plow, and don't look back. We thank you for loving us and for your word today. Help us to rejoice in you even now with great joy and singing because you are our great God and you've invited us into your house and you will dwell with us forever, forever because you are Jesus Christ who is God with us and you will be with us for all time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let's stand and sing one more time. If you need any prayers, the elders are here to pray with you.